Um, Raul, can you see me and can you hear me, right? Just yeah, I can hear you. Um, oh. Your laptop hasn't frozen, has it? Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, okay. Your laptop screen looks frozen. Um, yeah, the laptop's, wait, you mean my video or? Uh, the screen share. Maybe it isn't, but <laughs> I can't see any movement. Is that better now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, perfect. The voice you just heard that was um bro the secretary. Yeah, that, that's Astra Sock's secretary. By the way, everyone in pointing large just heard your voice because I've connected to the HDMI cable. <laughs> right. Um we're gonna get started and I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone for joining us today. This is Tea Talk and Telescope. And as the name suggests, we're going to have tea after the talk. And we're going to have the talk. And unfortunately, it's looking like we're not gonna have telescope tonight because the weather is absolutely horrible. And yeah, extra thank you to everyone for making it here, especially with the rain. <laughs> so with no further ado, I'm gonna get started. First, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Anwesha. I'm a year four student here at the University of Birmingham. I am currently doing my master's in astrophysics. I am a particle physics and cosmology student. However, thanks to AstroSoc and some research projects I did over the last few years, I realized that I like the stars more than I like smashing particles together. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, a little more background about me. I'm from India and Tanzania, and that really has shaped kind of my career as well, because Tanzania was where I fell in love with the stars first. So we're going to get started. The talk is, that I'm going to present today is the end of the universe. And thank you and a huge shout out to everyone here and especially to everyone who showed up to our last event two weeks ago, because this topic was chosen by you, which means I'm extra excited to talk to you about this. Right, so when I was preparing for this talk, like every person in the 21st century, the first thing I did was I Googled the end of the universe to figure out, you know, let's see what, what's out there. And it was, it was, I, was, I wasn't entirely surprised. It was pretty like what I was expecting. But one thing that did pop out is that there's lots of interesting names and in, that's involved with the end of the universe, like the big crunch, the big bounce, the, big rip, the freeze, the decay, like, it just serves to prove the point that us astronomers and scientists, we have a very amazing sense of humor. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the end of the universe or how the universe began is often very much popularized in science fiction. And a lot of the most interesting headlines on news channels or like science, like, you know, article places or, you know, the end of the universe or this has been observed or is there like, and just as a show of hands, how many of us in here have seen some kind of movie involving the end of the universe at the start of the universe or something about the universe blowing up? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Does Ben 10 count? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I grew up watching Ben 10. I love Ben 10. <laughs> so I took, decided to turn that kind of into, you know, the reason why I chose physics. And yeah, and before we continue with the talk, just to get an idea of, you know, where all of our like understanding is or our level is, of, you know, what we know about the end of the universe. Um, please do go on to slido.com and feel free to enter the code that is shown. If that doesn't work, you can try the QR code. Uh, when you enter the code, it might tell you that the poll isn't active yet, but if it does that, it will show you that there's something called TTT in the bottom. If you click that, it should work. It's a word cloud, by the way. Is it working? There's some really interesting answers in here. So we've got the Big Bang, 
we've got Doctor Who, we've got mm -hmm. a lot, we've got some physics book, which is incredibly accurate. Any more answers? <laughs> right. There's the heat death, entropy, the big crunch, simulation, Patricia's OBS cause lecture. If so, that is a, that's a lecture module for year three and four physics. If you're on the physics course, so I did that module. Who knows if you're doing that? Um, depressing. <laughs> there is there is a depressing aspect to it. The arrow of time reversal, singularity. I see by, but I'm <laughs> very confused by that. <laughs> um, has no end. CMB, hot rebirth, explosion from a singular, not a lot. How nice <laughs> explosion, boom. Yes, yes, yeah, that's fine. Yes, yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so. As we can see, we all do know a fair extent about what the Big Bang was or you know what the universe is going to evolve into. It is a fairly popular concept. So today, in today's what I aim to do with the talk today is to give you a little more of a perspective as to what cosmological models we have out there, how cosmology works today. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you will get a little more of a sense of you know how you choose to think about science and how you want to think about cosmology or how physics should proceed in terms of theories and you know how to make science proceed in a way that it's not biased and that it's balanced and that brings me to the next section which is what i'm going to talk about today so we're going to talk about what happened in the beginning in the beginning there was a big bang so that's what we're going to start with and some of the current models. And then we're gonna talk about the multiverse theory. Any multiverse theory like fans out here? Yay, woohoo. Um, inflation, does that ring a bell? Yeah, oh, if you said, if someone said OBS cause, so inflation would have come up in that lecture module at some point. That's you. <laughs> yeah, I had my guesses it was you. <laughs> the ekpyrotic theory or the big bounce theory and one or two other more concepts and what these mean for science and cosmology. So in the beginning, so we all agree, or science as a whole, generally, we agree that in the beginning, everything in the universe and the observable universe that we see was condensed into a single point or a singularity that was incredibly hot and dense. And this was the singularity that we call the Big Bang. It was this Big Bang that led to the universe as we know it. And essentially the reason why we know that there was a big bang is when we look out into the night sky or if when we look out into just the sky in general not the night sky <laughs> if we look out into the sky we see this uniform radiation or this glow all around and this glow is what we call the cosmic microwave background so the way the electromagnetic spectrum works is that the longer the wavelength the lower the energy and this cosmic microwave background is currently in the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum that is not the highest of energies. And this microwave energy, or like this micro, uh, microwave background corresponds to a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin or about three Kelvins all over, like it's a uniform glow all around. And that means that if it's that cool now, and just for reference point, three Kelvin is about minus 270 degrees Celsius. So it's really, really cold. <laughs> and yeah, if it's that cool right now and it's cooling down even further, that means that it must have been incredibly hot at some point. And it must have been incredibly hot and dense because the universe, as we can see as for observations is expanding because everything that's further away is moving even further away, even faster. And that effectively is why we agree on there being a big bang. And that radiation that we observe today is a relic of the Big Bang, effectively. And this cosmic microwave background, if you're interested in it, I really recommend that you look into it. It was discovered by Penzias and Wilson in 1965. And there was, there was a pigeon involved. There were multiple pigeons involved. They sacrificed their life for this. <laughs> no, they literally did because they shot them down thinking that it was pigeon poop, which was causing their 
signal <laughs> on their on their radio receivers. So they thought that the pigeon poop was the reason why they were not able to get rid of this background noise. And then even when they killed those poor pigeons and cleaned their <laughs> antennae and everything, guess what? The signal was still there. So for the sake of the pigeons, guys. <laughs> And as we, um, can you see the cursor? No, oh, the cursor is not visible. Okay. So we have the Big Bang and following the Big Bang, as you can see, we eventually led to first you have, you know, just a massive soup of particles, really hot, really dense gas, ions, electrons, and then eventually as the universe cools down, all of these particles, they cool down and they clump, and then you start getting the first atoms forming, and then eventually you get molecules. And it, this is a rough timeline, so I'm not gonna read through it, but eventually, after a very, very long time, after three billion years, that's when you start getting structure formation beginning to happen. And because we know that light has a finite speed, that means the further we look out, if we say something is 10 billion light years away, for instance, we're looking 10 billion years into the past. And in that way, the furthest that we can see is 13.7 billion years away. Um, no, wait, yeah, effectively, yeah, that is the furthest we can see, which is why we believe that the Big Bang occurred at least 13.7 billion years ago. And that brings me to the next topic or the first proper topic of today's talk, which is inflation. So if we agree that we have the Big Bang, at which point everything was condensed into the super dense, super tiny singularity region, then that means that we would and then we, in addition to that, we also see that nowadays, and that if we go back to this slide and we look at this image, we can see that all regions are not the same color. There are some fluctuations. And these fluctuations, um, if we remove this red bit in the middle, that is the Milky Way galaxy, so that can be filtered out. If that is filtered out, then the temperature fluctuations that we see is of the order 10 to the minus five. So that's the difference. So there are temperature fluctuations. So we ideally, we would expect there to be no temperature fluctuations, but we do see temperature fluctuations. And because there are temperature fluctuations, what that means is that at the Big Bang, at this point of singularity, everything was not the same. And the way, the easiest way for everything to not be the same is if they were not all at the exact same point. So what that means is that all the regions that we see on that map at the Big Bang, if we draw the timeline all the way back to the beginning, they were not in contact in the early times. That is a problem. And as for the cosmolog cosmological answers, effectively, there's basically no reason why regions larger than the size of a grain should be at the same temperature. So we cannot prove that. And that is Due to mathematical proofs, I could go down a little bit into the equations, but I did promise no equations, so there are not going to be any equations. And this is basically the temperature fluctuation that we mentioned. So the change in temperature between the average temperature that we observe between these regions is 0 0.00005 Kelvin. So there is that temperature difference. And that is kind of confusing because while you would expect everything to be the same temperature, it is not, which means that the theories need improving. And there's something in there that is not being accounted for. And this brings us to the solution that is inflation. And it is, the, so cosmology has three main problems. So one of them is effectively like the, the the fact that the universe looks the same pretty much in every direction, and that is also known as the horizon problem. The other problem that we see is that we only see magnetic dipoles, so everyone's played with a magnet at some point in their lives. We know that magnets, if you take the like poles, they repel each other. If you take the unlike poles, they... You can finish. Attract. Yeah, they attract. And when so we only see magnets appearing as, you know, north and south. We've never seen a magnet that's just a north. Like electric charges, we know that you could have a positive charge that just exists, and you could have a negative charge that just exists. They could both be doing their own thing, and nobody would care. But magnets don't do that. If you have a north, you need a south, and that's the way they work. But if elect, like, the, according to the theory of electromagnetism, you know that elect, we know that, you know, just the 
electromagnetic, the electric part and the magnetic part are very, very analogous. And effectively what that means is that if the electric field can have positive and negative charges, why can't the magnetic field do the same? And that is one of the other problems that we have. And the other problem is called the flatness problem. And this is something that we'll get to in a bit, but effectively there's this quantity in cosmology called the critical density, which is just the right amount of density for the universe to have for it to basically, you know, not collapse in on itself or not keep exponentially expanding so fast that structure cannot form. So we happen to be in a universe where everything is just right. And that is the flatness problem. And inflation was proposed to solve this. And it was proposed by this gentleman here, who is um, Professor Alan Guth. And I just realized I forgot to include his name on the slide, which is really embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is him. And uh, I believe this is around 1974 or around the 1980s. And he came up with an incredible theory, which is genuinely impressive because he suggested that we know that there's a Big Bang and we know that we have these problems. The easiest way, or not the easiest way, it's not easy, uh, or the, one of the most effective ways to explain this is if the universe expanded really, really fast. And we're basically saying that the universe expanded absolutely momentously between 10 to the minus 36 and 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang. And this was driven by a form of energy known as inflationary energy. The math worked a bit. And the reason why a bit is going to become apparent right now. So we still do see density fluctuations. And we also need dark energy, but dark, um, so I'm going to get to dark energy in a little bit, and we not only need the dark energy, we also need the right amount of dark energy. So in modern cosmology, it is accepted that in order for the universe to expand, you need dark energy to kind of, you know, accelerate or propel that expansion. It's a force, effectively, and or a potential field for the physicists out there. And there's a lot of different theories for what this could be, but the common umbrella term that we tend to use is dark energy. So while inflation kind of explains how things would have evolved in terms of, you know, the universe just expanded very, very fast in an infinitesimally small amount of time, that explained and kind of solved a lot of the big problems that inflation was having. But there was one kind of issue that still you know, flagged or long, and this was rooted in the anthropic principle. And in the previous slide, I mentioned that we need dark energy, but we also need just the right amount of dark energy. And that has its roots in the anthropic principle, because for instance, if the universe had 10 to the minus 10%, so that's 0. add nine zeros, and then a 1% more dark energy than it has right now, it would have expanded incredibly fast. And if it expands incredibly fast, that means that you're not gonna get enough time for all the ions and the atoms that you, or, or sorry, all the ions and electrons that you have and the particles that you have at times very close to the Big Bang to be able to lose sufficient energy and then combine and form all these atoms and molecules that would eventually have led to structure formation that leads to, you know, star formation, so stars of hydrogen, helium, and all the other, you know, higher mass elements, such as, you know, all the way up to iron and uranium and stuff like that. That wouldn't have been possible if we had just, you know, that teeny tiny bit more of dark energy. And in addition to that, if there was a little less, then the opposite would have occurred. It would have collapsed on itself even before, you know, structure formation could have gotten to that advanced stage. And that would have, that is what cosmologists call the big crunch. And it seems rather coincidental that our universe effectively has the fundamental laws that we observe it. It definitely has the laws that we observe it to have, but we can't really defend that, you know, this is why it has it. And the anthropic principle effectively is science's way of saying, it is what it is. We, we exist effectively because the conditions are right for you know, us to exist. And if you're confused, please do stop me because this is a confusing topic.
confusing ish no. yeah no <laughs> so the question is why do we have the perfect amount of dark energy it seems a lot like a coincidence and that is a big problem that we currently face with the anthropic principle and as I was doing some reading, I found this relatively interesting article on Forbes, and it's a very like it's at the right level if you don't have a physics background as well. So please do give it a read if you're interested. And I'm going to read from this quote that we have that is from this article, and that's effectively saying that we exist within this universe, which has the fundamental parameters, constants and laws that it has and our existence is proof enough that the universe allows for creatures like us to come into existence within it so what it's saying is that it's basically a coincidence that we exist and this effectively led to the whole idea of you know and the theory of inflation being popularized because as humans we kind of like to embrace the idea that you know, we feel special that our universe exists because, you know, it's perfect. If the universe was just a little bit different, we wouldn't be here. And you know what? It's amazing that we exist, which is why inflation was incredibly popularized. And that kind of led to the concept of the multiverse. I did go out a little bit extra on this slide, as you can see, with the question marks. And this personally, like the fact that inflation relies on the anthropic principle and the multiverse theory was derived from it always makes me go very, very, you know, confused and puts me in a dilemma about how I want to view science because, yes, it is true, inflation is a fantastic theory. But at the same time, even though it answers a lot of the questions, if you're taking advantage of numbers just to say that, you know, this is true, this has to be true because, you know, we don't really have, you know, much, I guess, other theories to compete with it, then is it still science or are you just putting your point across and trying to, I guess, you know, just make someone believe in it without having facts to prove it? And that leads to the multiverse theory. The multiverse theory is a combination of string theory, inflation, and the anthropic principle. So in a nutshell, the anthropic principle again, it's basically everything is the way it is because we're here to see it. Inflation, the universe expanded exponentially between 10 to the minus 36 and 10 to the minus 34 seconds right after the Big Bang from this energy called the inflationary energy. And string theory is a theory of, is one of the most, that's yeah, it's basically one of the fundamental building block theories of physics in the sense that if you were to go deeper and deeper within a nucleus, for instance, like further deeper than a quark, and the quarks are like one of the tiniest particles we know, then it says that all matter that we have is made up of these fundamental particles called strings. And the way that these strings vibrate, that, that determines how different particles behave. So if a string vibrates a certain way, then it could be an electron if it vibrates a different way. It could be a muon, for instance. And this eventually leads to the multiverse theory, because if inflation states that you know, our universe has the right amount of dark energy, and the math says that you can have, you can ideally have any amount of dark energy as you'd like, but we observe the amount of dark energy that we do, and that happens to be just right for our universe, that means there could be infinite number of universes out there, which could have all these infinite different amounts of dark matter. Now, I could take it a stretch further, which is something that I have seen a lot in genuine science documentaries. That means that in some other universe out there, there could be an exact copy of you with a different hairstyle. For instance, there could be a different, there could be a me giving a talk in some parallel universe today, except that I could be wearing a blue shirt, for instance. And there's nothing stopping that from happening because the math says so, because the probability of having something, of having a different amount of dark energy is about the same as the probability of having the universe with the dark energy amount that we have here. And that is what makes me a bit unhappy about it because that doesn't really, ex like that's not a plausible enough explanation or not a strong enough explanation as to why the universe is the way it is. And somewhere along the way, the key question was lost and the cosmological models being developed, no one really 
bother to answer at this point, what caused that big bang? Yeah, we do have the big bang. The universe does expand. Why did it bang in the first place? We don't really, that was not answered yet. And in a nutshell, the multiverse theory is a bit of a theoretical construct. And the universal speed limit, which is the speed of light, that is three mm -hmm. times 10 to the power of eight, so three with eight zeros after it, meters per second, nothing can travel faster than that. However, there is a caveat to that, which is that nothing in the universe can travel faster than the speed of light, but space itself can travel faster than the speed of light. But one thing that would be necessary to be able to you know, figure out whether or not the multiverse theory is true or not is to be able to find proof for it. And the way we find proof in physics or science in general is we use electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation obeys the speed limit, which is the speed of light. So if we cannot intercept such signals from, let's say, like we can send a signal to some parallel universe out there, even if we had, let's say, like billions and trillions of years, because it's not gonna get past the boundary of our very own universe, because our universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. Like the rate of the expansion of the universe, because our universe is expanding, is faster than that. You can't really escape the universe. So some very smart scientists out there, so they're string theorists and cosmologists at the Parameter Institute and some other institutes around the world. So the Parameter Institute is a theoretical physics institute in Canada. And one of their, um, their associate researchers, um, Matthew Johnson, he focuses on this exact problem. And I had the chance to ask him this very question when I was around 15 or 16, and I went to this institute for a summer school. And yeah, he came to give us a talk and I asked him, how are you gonna prove the multiverse theory? And I was very happy that day because he said he did not have an answer for me. And a few years down the road in 2017, I came across an article on the website for Parameter Institute that had a published paper linked to, and it was basically him and one of his colleagues working on that exact same problem, which is why he did not have an answer for me when I asked him that in 2015. But if you have multiverses, what his proposed proof for this states is that these multiverses, inevitably, they could collide with each other. So think of them as like soap bubbles. You have a wonderful, like you're, you're washing your dishes and then you have soap bubbles flying around and you have hundreds of them those soap bubbles will run into each other. And when they do run into each other, think of the soap bubble as a multiverse. If you, have two multiverse, if you have two universes colliding, those universes would leave imprints on each other. And this is what we call the bruises in the CMB. And these bruises are effectively patterns in the cosmic microwave background. So if we think back to that first slide that we saw with pretty pictures and before, like how we had the big bang and the timeline that would be visible in in that cmb image that we saw and studying and looking for such patterns and that would help figure out you know what exactly is you know when did maybe for instance how many universes collided or did we in fact have a like a universe you know collide with our universe is the multiverse theory true or not but it is a little bit of a theoretical construct at this point in that we don't really, we don't really exactly know how we're gonna go about it, except if you do wanna read the paper, please do go for it. It's quite a lengthy paper, but if you're into cosmology, you will definitely enjoy it. And one of the next concepts that we're gonna talk about is the concept of eternal inflation, which is synonymous with the multiverse theory effectively. And I was not able to paraphrase this into a slide, so I did what every student does best, take notes and use the highlighter. <laughs> so effectively, what the eternal inflation theory says is that, yes, there are multiverses, but all of these multiverses started at the same Big Bang. So you have the Big Bang. And if you remember, if you remember all the way back to the start of the talk, when I mentioned the temperature changes, that's the 10 to the power of minus five, those temperature fluctuations, those temperature fluctuations mean that there are density fluctuations and at that, you know, the teeny tiny point before the Big Bang or at the Big Bang, which 
means that as that tiny region expands, so will the density fluctuations. Like there, as those regions expand, each of those tiny regions, as it gets bigger, it's gonna, each of those regions is gonna have a different amount of matter in it. And it's gonna have a different amount of energy in it. And as a result of that, each of those regions is gonna expand at a different rate. And as it expands at a different rate, it's going to create its own little like bubble. And it's not going to be able to, as in communicate or pass information outside its own little bubble, which has its own amount of dark energy, its own amount of you know matter. And each of those bubbles is a universe and ours is one like that. And each of those bubbles keeps on expanding. And that is the concept of eternal inflation. So inflation is never gonna end effectively is what it says. And that brings us to the next theory, which is kind of a decent contender, I would say, to the inflation theory and or to the multiverse theory. The multiverse theory says that effectively, you know, we have the right amount of dark energy. So there must be other universes out there which have just, you know, like all the different kinds of amounts of dark energies that are possible. And the ekpyrotic theory or the big crunch, um, I meant to say big bounce, that is a typo. <laughs> the ekpyrotic theory or the big bounce theory effectively does exactly what its name says. And if you think of it like two, universes colliding back and forth. But before we get to that, we're going to look a little bit at a little bit of cosmology. So a snippet from some of my modules in cosmology that I've done. And that is the fate of the universe depends on its curvature. So the universe has, as the model suggests, or as the math says, you know, the universe can be curved in three, like one of three different ways. So you could have zero curvature, like the first image where we see that it's flat, so you, have, you have an so if you have two points, they're going to be parallel to each other at all given times. Positive curvature, like a tennis ball, for instance, or negative curvature, which is effectively like a Pringle. And <laughs> <laughs> so in a universe that is zero curvature, the density of the universe is just right, as in it will just about like just barely scrape that point where it would have, you know, started collapsing in on itself. And it's going to have just crossed that threshold and it's going to keep expanding forever. A universe with positive curvature is going to recollapse because the density of such a universe is more than the critical density. So the, if we think back to what we discussed earlier, the critical density is just the right amount of density that you need for the universe that we currently have effectively. So the universe that keeps on expanding forever is does not collapse in on itself and it does not you know expand so fast that structure doesn't form so structure does form and that is what the critical density is or you could have the negative curvature where the temperature is less than this critical density and the universe will easily expand forever and ever and ever and you would never have had the pretty galaxies you wouldn't have the stars you wouldn't have nebulae we wouldn't exist, <laughs> or that's what the anthropic principle would say. <laughs> so observations favor the fact, or not the fact, favor the, I guess, postul um, the observations <laughs> favor that we could have zero curvature. So cosmology is very much a field where we do work backwards to an extent. So we see something and then we try to build models to explain why it could have been the way it is. And it seems to work okay, I guess. <laughs> and that is why we think that the current universe that we're in, that is probably a zero curvature universe. The big bounce or the big crunch universe is going to be a positive curvature -ish universe because well, that might be this type out there. But yeah, the universe would have, if it recollapses, that means that you would be able to have a positive curvature. And this is how the ekpyrotic theory works. So taking string theory as its foundation, if you take a string, so a string is something that's, for instance, like one dimension, and 
String theory works in multiple dimensions, so it can have up to 10 or 11 different dimensions. And the easiest way for us to visualize it as humans, because we are three-dimensional creatures, is to think about if you were to take the string to the next dimension, it would turn into something flat, and th that is what string theorists would call a membrane. And this membrane is, um, you can shorten it to call it a brain. And these brains are effectively massive equivalents of strings or a higher dimension equivalent of a string. And as a result, you could have these brains moving in space. And this was a very ingenious idea because until the founders of the ekpyrotic theory thought of this, no one had thought of the fact that you could have these strings in a higher dimension and at such large scales and they could be moving. And effectively, when you have the moving brains, so like you have a brain, you have a brain, they could collide. And within each of these brains is the universe. And our brain would be in one of these universes. And every time that these brains collide, that is the Big Bang. And after the Big Bang, the brains move apart. And then as the brains move apart, due to the Big Bang, you would have a burst of radiation and matter. And that would lead to what we see in the cosmic microwave background. So what inflation predicts is also what this big bounce theory or the ekpyrotic theory predicts. Both models can predict that exact same pattern to be observed. And the radiation imprints from these previous universes, so for instance, because it's a cyclic universe, you have the universes you know, moving together, colliding, and then they move apart, and then they move together again, and then they collide, you have another Big Bang, and that process repeats itself over and over and over again. And that would leave imprints. So, and as a result of those imprints, you would be able to see that in the cosmic microwave background, and that could potentially help determine whether or not such a collision has happened in the past. So there is a proposed experimental method to be able to see it, which is very similar to the bruises that we discussed with, you know, potential multiverse, you know, colliding with our, or a potential other universe colliding, like the multiverse theory bubbles, colliding with the universe that we see, and that would leave bruises in the microwave background. So there are pros to this, so it gets the job done. It does exactly <laughs> what inflation and the multiverse theory states. So the Big Bang is still exactly as powerful as earlier models. The same cosmic microwave background pattern is observed and it is as robust and inflation and the multiverse theory, they both rely on string theory and so does the Big Bounce theory. But at the same time, it's not quite there yet because you cannot calculate every single nitty gritty detail of the brain collision. These brains would be massive, like massive, massive. And we're talking scale of the size of the universe and beyond. So that's something that we can't really, like it's difficult to visualize, but in astronomical terms, it's massive. And one question that it's still answering is, did inflation happen in every single region? And it's okay, I feel like at this point I should point out, it's okay if you're feeling confused by this because these questions have taken years and years and years of research and we're talking like decades of research to be able to arrive at them and they're not the easiest concepts to wrap your mind around or your brain around. Did you get that? <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> so now we have these two models effectively we have the multiverse theory and we have the big bounce theory. Well, what, and they both seem to be equally robust and they both can predict similar levels of you know, imprints in the cosmic microwave background. They both rely on string theory. So what exactly, or why should we worry about, you know, why, should, why did scientists even bother with having the big bounce theory formed in the first place if you know, inflation and multiverse was doing an okay job. And, the reason for that comes back to the very fundamental, you know, one of the cornerstones for science is that 
in science, like, of course, we do have some things which are absolute, for instance, in our universe, like the speed of light or constants and stuff like that. But a theoretical model cannot be accepted to be absolute unless there is experimental evidence for it. And that is one of the key points or the key, I guess, mistakes in a way of perspective that scientists made is that there was a huge like, acceptance in the community that, you know, inflation and the multiverse have to be right. Like there, you just can't, you know, argue with that. No one just, no one was bothered. And that is why, like, I think that these two scientists, so Neil Tyrock and Paul Steinhardt, they definitely contributed to, you know, making science and physics and cosmology realize that you do need competition between theories because you can't really, just because let's say method A works does not mean that you just stop at method A if there could be a method B that could also work. And once people get trapped in that mindset, it's very difficult for science to progress. And effectively this is, yeah, this is basically Neil Tyrock putting that in his own words and that, that was me paraphrasing what his perspective was and when he refers to this bizarre landscape picture or the random process that is effectively inflation. So when he says, the majority view at the moment is this rather bizarre landscape picture where somebody or some random process and no one knows how it happens chooses for us to be in these universes. And the idea of coincidences is not very scientific as a scientist. And that is something that bothered them and they decided to dig into it and they came up with the big bounce theory, not because they were like, I am right, this has to be right, but they had that idea that science needs to be like, science needs to be not subjective, but objective. And that is exactly what they did. They came up with another theory, which was just as strong to show that, you know, inflation and multiverse theory are not the absolute. And I have definitely given a lot of my views already to this point, <laughs> but in a nutshell, yeah, there's too many people in the community who accept that inflation is the one and only correct theory, definitely explains and aids the math a lot. And if you're doing the observational cosmology course, then absolutely you will come across inflation and you will see why the math works out and why this is a good one. But it still does not explain where this inflationary energy came from. So the inflationary energy that led to the universe expanding exponentially in the 10 to the minus 36 or 10 to 10 to the minus 34 seconds, we still don't have an explanation for where that energy came from. And we still exactly don't really have an answer for what caused the bang. Like we have a big bang, we don't know why it banged exactly. I mean, there are theories, but if we were able to get an answer for what, where that inflationary energy came from, we definitely would have some support for, you know, why did it bang? What banged? <laughs> and science, if you have a theory, the theory is basically right until it's proven wrong in a way. But then unless you have evidence for it, you can't really say that a theory is definitely right. And bias, when it, and you know, like just, I guess, human psychology, when it comes into the picture of, you know, something is right, like, or I worked so hard my entire life on, let's say, the multiverse theory or the inflationary theory, that if someone comes along and says, you know, you know, maybe it's not the theory, maybe there's something else there which could also explain it. That is not very healthy for science. And as scientists, it's difficult because we're humans first. <laughs> we need to ensure that, I guess, for the a healthy progress that mindset should be challenged and oop, there we go uh, and, and that brings me very close to the end of the talk so if you have if you would like to look into this further there's some documentaries the last link right there is the documentary that got me hooked onto the concept of the multiverse theory when i was fairly young and if and that's delivered by a dr brian green uh he's a theoretical physicist i think he's at stanford you know, columbia university and do watch the documentary it's definitely one of my favorites of all time and i did write two articles about the multiverse theory and the epirotic theory which probably did a better job of, at explaining the concepts of today 
<laughs> and do have a look at that if you'd like. And do check out my website because I do publish some articles and sciencey stuff up there. And there is a feature called Ask a Physicist where you can, you know, submit any questions you have, and I, the physicist, will either try to answer them or I will talk. I will chase down physics professors in the department and get them to give their views and answer them and put them up as like a blog post or something. And that brings me to the end of my talk. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Ooh, wow. Um, uh, just first things first, um, you're okay if the talk is still recorded, right, as we answer the questions? Or if, if anyone is not okay with it, please do let me know. I can switch off the recording. Okay. Um, we'll start at the back and make our way to the front. So, yeah. Um, the multiverse, the multiverse is that you said float around, like the safe bubbles, right? Yeah. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are outside our current universe. So our universe is one of those soap bubbles. And the limit of how far we can see is kind of the boundary of that soap bubble. And anything outside that soap bubble, we cannot see it because of the universal speed limit because the soap bubble is expanding faster than the speed of light. So we can't really send you know, electromagnetic radiations or get the light from those other universes or the multiverses. Does that answer your question? So they're around in like I think so. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that bothers me very much as well. So I cannot give a definite answer because I'm not a full fledged cosmologist yet. But they're floating around somewhere for sure. They exist, so they have to be somewhere. Yeah, and that somewhere is probably a bigger verse. I don't know if we should use the term universe for it. Yeah. That's a really bad answer. I'm so sorry, but does that kind of help understand it? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what are the positive effects of technology? Mm -hmm. um, we know it's currently in the light of the spectrum. Now, what could this physics have? So is there a positive proof of physics that was at a higher uh, energy level? And how do you know it's not just caused by the attenuation of the electromagnetic waves? So, the reason why we, um, I'm going to answer the second question first. So the reason why we know that it is not like it. So you mentioned that it is not caused by the attenuation. How do we know it's not this attenuation of the wave over time? So it is the attenuation of waves over time. That is exactly what it is in the sense that when the Big Bang occurred, that is when the energy levels were the highest. And if we think of the electromagnetic spectrum, the highest energy levels we have are like gamma rays and beyond, and the lowest energy waves. Or of that, or the lowest energy range is the radio waves. So it did, in fact, attenuate from those higher temperatures from the gamma region all the way up until the microwave spectrum, which is where we currently see it. And it eventually, like billions and billions of years forward, it will make its way into the radio part of the spectrum. So if there are advanced creatures who will study that background in the future, they will probably not call it the cosmic microwave background. It will probably turn into the cosmic radio background or something like that. And in terms of the, the first part of the question that you asked, like, how do we know that? That is definitely the best answer I have is that the cosmological models that we have today, which match the current like values of the parameters that we see in the universe, if you extrapolate those models, you know, back in time, you will see that the temperature does increase as we go further back. And yeah, the, the simplest answer is the models do support that, and the observations that we see today are in line with that effectively. We can chat about this after the lecture as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll go that way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, um, yeah. You mentioned something that you don't add it in and you don't know where the inflation energy with it came from. So this, I, I have a very basic concept of energy. Um, but does that mean that you don't know where it was transferred? Um, so inflationary energy um, is basic. So if you think about the Big Bang, the Big Bang was a singularity. That's when the explosion happened. And inflationary energy, the way, like from my limited understanding, is that it was effectively, it's a field or physical like concept, like a potential field or an energy field. 
that is introduced to help get rid of like, let's say all the unwanted parameters that you have, like the unwanted nuisances that you have when you construct a model. And that is the way the theories are sometimes made. So you try to fix it with the math first and then check out the physical implications of it. And in that way, if you add this inflationary energy to it with a specific value, that allows for the universe to expand exponentially. And that exponential expansion fixes all these other nuisances in the model. Does that help answer the question? Sort of? Sure. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yes? So we just to go back to this question. Yeah. So you said that the reason why we know this is how the models are extrapolated backwards in time. And yeah. That's how we think they would work. Yeah. What if, for instance, like in many cases, the model just does not work if you extrapolate it backwards? And so like, there is a, a database, and what if the data was changed and then just the model is smaller? What would be the implication of that? We would need new science is probably the easiest implication of that. We would need better models of like newer models. If we come across, so the, one of the reasons why I think such a thing would not happen is because the models that we have, they support what we see up until today, like up until where the universe, like at the current stage of evolution. If we want to, if, there was something that, that we observe in the near future, for instance, we do have models for what is what we think could happen in the future. If something happens that does not fit one of those models, that would mean that up until the point that we are at today, the models are probably okay, but then onwards, the models would need fixing. So my bet would be that the models would definitely need altering, but it probably would not need a complete like upheaval if that makes sense um yes i think there was a question did you have a question uh, yeah yeah so in the cognitive microwave radiation you mentioned that it, there's discrepancies detected when two multi-universes pass by mm -hmm. each other why where's the correlation why does that happen that is something that probably a postdoctoral researcher in the field would be able to answer because these patterns are very very specific to like the map the equations and the parameters that these un that each of those universes that collided has and if um, so one of the papers that's linked to in that specific slide so this is going to be on youtube and i can send you the link later as well if you look into that link they do explain in so there's articles and there's the paper. You could read through whichever one makes more sense to you, but they it's a bit more specific than I currently understand it. Well, I, I don't currently understand well enough to explain to someone else without risking giving wrong information. <laughs> but yeah, there they, there is a method that you can find those imprints effectively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, you said um, that the brains were smaller than the frogs and they did. Yeah, so string theory effectively that it, that does say that you know strings are incredibly small and they are the way that they behave determines what determines the physical properties of things that we observe. And the reason why the brains can be thought like do like will work is to do with the fact that with the different dimensions that string theory has. So string theory, as we know, it is about it's more than 10 dimensions of space and one of time at least. And in terms of visualizing it, it is very, very difficult to visualize it, of course, but I have not looked into the math behind this personally because I'm not a theorist, but it is definitely very, very, like it, it is a plausible thing that you could take this, take the higher dimension version of the string and blow it up effectively. And because it's at a higher dimension and our universe as we see it is in three dimensions, this, these higher dimensions are some things that we are, are a thing that we cannot observe. And that higher dimension space is where these membranes are, if that makes any sense at all. So it looks very small, but it's actually very big. 
kind of, I guess. Yeah, I don't want to give wrong information, but I feel like this is something that if you come across a theoretical physicist who does string theory, please do ask them for sure. <laughs> And if I find the answer someday, I will get it to you. I can't know where to find you. Um, is it okay if I go there with a little So when the brains collide, that, that causes the big bang. So, so yeah. how many, well, my question would be, how many brains do they like keep the for the brain? Or is it like activation energy, there's so much energy? I like the term activation energy. Are you a chemistry person? No. no, no. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yes, you need you need two brains to collide because the concept is of having parallel universes, and each time these two uh, these two universes collide, that's when you get the big bang. And in terms of activation energy, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't really know if there is the concept of an activation energy right there, but then. There are certain parameters, like for instance, you know, the amount of dark energy or how much energy goes into one universe, how much goes into the other universe, and stuff like that that does come into play with the so models. Do we have multiple brains arguing with each other? At once? Yeah. I have <laughs> not thought of that. <laughs> Could do. Let me tell you what, there is a book called Endless Universe that was written by Neil Turok, who is the founder of the Ekpyrotic theory. You should read that. Yeah, <laughs> he goes into the details of like he doesn't use equations a lot, but he does a very good job of explaining what the equations do and what the mathematical models say. And I, I think there was some part of the book that did mention having multiple brains and stuff, but do grab a look at that. And if I come across the answer, I will put them across. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Yes. I know this is a really broad question, but is there anything that James Webb can tell us about the end of the universe or anything that he captured to indicate anything about the end of the universe? So the end of the universe is it's a relatively open ended like uh, thing for cosmology because there are quite a few models, for instance, like you know the universe eternal inflation model or the big crunch model. The way that we can study how the universe like behaves, yes, James Webb to an extent can help us because you can study or you can view objects which are very, very far away. And oftentimes observing these far away objects and how you know the spectrum from those are, that really does help us understand you know, how the universe behaved when it was very early and like very early on. And that would help us, you know, place constraints in the models that we currently have. So it would help us understand how the universe is going to evolve eventually. In terms of understanding, I guess, a little more about, like, for instance, how the universe is going to evolve from the, co the cosmic microwave background perspective, if we got a better telescope out there, it would give us more details. And potentially, maybe that's where you could see the, these imprints of the bruises or you know, the fingerprints of the collisions, or the, the membranes colliding, or the multiverses you know, going through each other and stuff like that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so a couple of theories that you've outlined depend very heavily on string theory. Yeah. String theory is at best incomplete and at yeah. worst prolifically wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in 40 years since its sort of conception, there has been basically no evidence found for it. And you can make a lot of these claims about it that are allowed within mathematics, mm -hmm. but there is again no evidence for them, and in some cases they are completely untested. Yeah. You know, so bunny, bu bubbles of multiverses, mm -hmm. you could argue that no way we'd ever come up with an experiment to test that. So are these theories, what what makes these theories worth considering given that their sort of basis is even complete in of itself and they are difficult and impossible to test? That's a very good question. Exactly better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and to answer your question, Yes, science is very incomplete at the moment. One of the biggest problems that physics faces right now is a special relativity and like stuff like relativity is not compatible with quantum mechanics. And string theory is one of the proposed theories that tries to unify that. The other contender is with quantum gravity. And although 
people have been working on these theories or like these models for like 40 years, 50 years or so, these are still relatively new fields. And it's, I would go on to say that they're still at the early-ish stages because you definitely, there, there are, there is more work that theoretical physicists and, you know, theoretical like cosmologists would have to do to figure out, you know, how to fix those issues. But the good thing is that now we are a, in like in the age that we can get unprecedented amounts of data. And there is a chance that theoretical physics could work backwards from the data and use that to prove like the new data that we get, use the fit models to that and then work backwards and see, you know, how can we fix these loops or like these little or these little like holes in the theory. So in a short in a nutshell, no, we don't really have a very solid reason as to why this, like as to why we spent that much time, you know, on something that we don't know we can prove as such. But then I guess the easiest analogy or like, you know, sort of parallel that I can draw is that earlier people used to think, you know, the earth is flat. And that was until we started getting experimental evidence and stuff that, you know, it is not flat or that the earth is not the center of the universe. So there is a lot that physics and theoretical physics is yet to answer. And I think it is going to be very heavily based on data that we get. So that is, yeah. So your answer is keep probing and see if you find any data. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Flat. Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> so the curvature of the universe is flat according to observations like or we most we think that most likely the universe is flat as far as the shape of the universe is concerned if you want to think of the multiple theory the easiest way to visualize it is a bubble if you want to think of it as a and when i say a bubble i mean a basically a region which does not interact with anything outside it Not necessarily, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've got a question from Rodri. Oh, okay. He says, what is your favorite theory as to the identity of dark matter? <laughs> <laughs> Just to be different about that. I want to say, okay, it depends on how much Rodri knows about this, because if I say wimps, will that make sense? Yes, probably. But you sound cool and also some particular matter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah um favorite theory, theory of dark matter i would say it's the wimp theory so that's the weakly interacting mass particles theory and the reason i guess is that we do have a lot of experiments ongoing so there's a chance that it could either be proven or disproven which is kind of good for science to progress either way okay. any more questions Woo. Okay. um I'll start there. Uh, yeah. And the curvature of space changes on. I believe so. Yes. If I'm, if I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it can. Yeah, it doesn't change as rapidly, but so the curvature of space time, like it's there's like a graph that goes with it, and that graph definitely has a gradient to it, that a gradient that changes to it. So yes, it does. It can change. Yes, there were two other questions. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned uh, early in the presentation that when we observe, we observe something usually, and then we figure out why that works that way. Is that really the best approach at doing that? Cosmology wise. Cosmology wise, it kind of it works is the best answer in the sense that so we have a result yeah. in mind with that. I think from my perspective that will taint or bias away our method. So definitely that you do make a valid point to it. And the reason why science can work sometimes both ways is that when you build a model, you don't build a model just to be able to answer, for instance, you know, why something is the way that you see it. You also the model also needs to answer questions such as why doesn't this happen or why didn't that happen? And when it answers those <laughs> questions in a satisfactory way, that's when you can determine that you know this is a satisfactory model. And that is kind of what modern cosmology does to a fair extent. Can I add something again to that? Yeah. 
So when you have a, if you observe something and then you make a theory to describe it, if that theory is a good theory, then it will make new predictions um, that you can then go out and test. So for example, um, Einstein's general relativity uh, was made to describe the motions of the planets. But then you can go out and apply that to the cosmology, apply it to the expansion of the universe, you can apply it to the way that uh, light changes in galaxies can see from us. Um, and you can go out and measure all those things, and they turn out true. So you've got a theory to describe one thing, but then it describes a whole lot of other things that you can then go and test. So if, there's, if there is that inherent bias in there, and you're actually just coming up with something to match the data, then if it isn't true, it's not going to then, the predictions that they're making won't be correct. Um, and that's why arguably string theory is not a good theory because it doesn't make testable predictions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a string theory person, by the way. I'm not advocating for string <laughs> theory. <laughs> but thank you for that. That was very helpful. Yes? Um, you know, when you're talking about the curvature of the universe, I'm talking about the density. Is the density of the universe fixed or so the density of the universe definitely changes with time because inherently the definition of density is such that it's like the easiest terms it's you know, mass over volume and the volume of the volume. universe increases. What you just got to mind, what is exactly density compared to the density of what the density of the universe as a whole? Or? The density of matter in the universe, the density of energy or radiation in the universe, so just all of those as a whole. And yeah. is that then what, if the density changes, is that what changes the curvature of the universe? Of the universe? They're definitely correlated, but I can't say for sure the the density would change the curvature. Yeah, but they're definitely correlated. Yeah. Seems like oh, okay. Last one. Yes. Uh, you said that the curvature of space changes over time, and then this graph. Did you say it has a gradient? Is it a positive or a negative gradient? It's so it is a positive gradient that gets less positive, I think. But I will have to double check on in the textbook that I'm thinking of with the graph to tell you for sure, but I can dig that up after the lecture and show it to you. Yeah. Uh, yes. So this is a bit of a weird question. Yeah. But so physics tells us that mass cannot be created or matter cannot be created or destroyed. What happens if, in some way, the multiversal theory is true and one universe attracts another universe? Could then the mass in either universe change because of attracting each other? In either universe, I guess it could change, but then the overall mass between the two universes would, or, and the energy would stay conserved. As per the physics laws, as we understand it. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's all the questions. and. Yeah, we're going to have tea and coffee and stuff available in the coffee lounge. And, yeah, and Oscar's, and, yeah, Oscar's got some announcements as well. Right. <laughs> right, I've got notes because there's quite a few, so just don't fall asleep. Um, so we have a Discord that we've created finally because we should have done that ages ago. Well, we did do it ages ago, 